Hi everyone, today's video is going to be based on two papers that I have written in collaboration with UCD professors Brian Caulfield, Angus Lawler and Barry Smith. So the first of which was entitled Using Case-Based Reasoning to Predict Marathon Performance and Recommend Tailored Training Plans and this was presented in the long paper proceedings at the International Conference of Case-Based Reasoning in June 2020 which was online and the second paper was entitled Providing Explainable Race Time Predictions and Training Plan Recommendations to Marathon Runners and this was presented in the short paper proceedings at REXIS 2020. So both of those papers will be linked down below if you're interested in reading them and this talk will be essentially largely based on the first paper with the addition of the new models that were used in the second paper and the results obtained in that second paper. So since this research is quite applied, I'm going to give a brief overview of the context, which is marathon running. So a marathon is a 42.2 kilometer run on road, track or cross country, and typically requires at least 12 to 16 weeks of intense training. Despite that, in recent years, there's been a huge influx in the number of people participating in endurance events. Specifically for marathon running, we have had a 50% worldwide increase in marathon participation from 2008, with over 1.3 million people participating in marathon events in 2018. Naturally, with the sport growing, that means many of the runners are either recreational or novice runners, and they tend to be quite limited by the one-size-fits-all resources available. So the main contributions of this work is wanting to provide support and advice for marathon runners as they train for, compete in and recover from their races. We will be using case-based reasoning methods with training session data in order to generate both race time predictions and training plan recommendations. So briefly for some understanding of the method of case-based reasoning for those of you who might be unfamiliar with this, Essentially, what case-based reasoning looks to do is to use the solutions to past problems to find a solution for a new similar problem. So the first thing when you have the problem, you want to find a suitable representation so that case-based reasoning can be used. And then it will take the form of a case. Then the next thing you can do is once you have a case, you can retrieve similar cases from your previous stored cases, which are stored in the case base. So these are all the previous similar problems which have had solved solutions. Then you will reuse the solutions for those retrieved cases in order to come up with a solution for the new case. So you'll find some suggested solution. You may need to revise this solution in order to make it fully fit with the new case. And once you have a definite solution, you will retain that in the case space as a learned case. And that means we can use it for future reference. So the way this, wor this works in the context of marathon running, we have a problem which could be the training that a runner has done in the lead up to a marathon. And the solution might be their race time. So we might have previous cases of training and race times, and we now want to predict the race time for a new runner. So to give an overview of the data that we have, we have over 1.5 million training sessions from more than 21,000 runners in the 16 week lead up to a marathon. And this is data obtained from the popular mobile fitness app Strava, which has been obtained through a data sharing agreement with them. So you can see that the data we have has distances for every 100 meters run as well as the time taken to run each of those 100 meter intervals and the elevations as well. These are then converted into a 100 meter pacing profile in minutes per kilometer. So to make very clear that pacing is in minutes per kilometer, meaning that a larger value for pace means a slower pace. Then we aggregated these individual training sessions into a number of weekly features including things like the number of sessions per week, the total distance run, the mean pace per week, the longest run distance, as well as the fastest or slowest one, five and 10 kilometer pace and the mean elevation gain. So then when we have these weekly training features, it's time to turn these into cases. 
So each individual case consists of the weekly training features F or W, as well as the marathon time achieved by a runner W weeks from now. So if we're at a point four weeks from the race, we'll have the cases including the training done in the fourth week from the race, as well as the marathon time achieved four weeks from now. We also have a pointer to the next week of training, so the week three weeks from the race. And each of these case bases are separated based on training week and sex. The reason being that there are physiological differences between males and females that lead to different training and race outcomes. As well, for the training weeks, it doesn't make sense to be recommending training to a runner who is at a point four weeks from the race when the training being recommended is at a point eight weeks from the race. So just to make very clear, one case is one training week for one runner. The first task that we're looking at is race time prediction, which is important because accurate estimates for marathon time helps runners to manage their race day expectations and assess their progress to date. Typically, the prediction equations will require either laboratory equipment, such as what you see on the right hand side, someone being tested for their VO2 max, or previous marathon times, which makes it unsuitable for novice or recreational runners. Our aim is to provide predictions at any point in training that can be used by novice and veteran runners alike. So for a runner or, we use their weekly training features on this week to find K similar cases and we average their marathon time components to find a predicted time for OR. In the Rexis paper, we used three different models, the first being the baseline model, so all of the features previously mentioned were used. The second was the feature selected model, so stepwise forward feature selection was used to identify the most important features for race time prediction in a given week. This is quite useful because on some weeks some features may be more important than others and it's possible that some of the features we thought would be useful aren't necessarily useful and could hinder the prediction outcome. In the previous paper the addition of multiple weeks was done through an ensemble of single week models so we used both a unordered four week model as well as a ordered four week model so the individual four week models were averaged together, their predicted times were averaged in order to give a value for the given week. In this current work, what we do did instead was incorporated past week's predicted times as features. So we're more implicitly carrying over training information from previous weeks. I'll explain a little bit why this new multi-week and in a sense an improved single week model is better than the ensemble model that we used before. But for now, moving on to the second task, which is training plan recommendation, you can see on the right hand side what we would like to achieve um, a recommended week of training given a goal time and a current point in training. We have some different sessions that are recommended, recovery, interval runs, tempo runs with different distances, as well as pacing recommendations. So why would you want to recommend the next week of training to a runner? It could be that they have received a predicted time that is slower than what they were hoping for. So they might want to target their goal time, which is a bit more ambitious, and they might need a more difficult training plan for that. Or it could be the other situation that so far their training has already been quite strenuous and they would like to target a slower time and then decrease their training efforts. So for this, what we are using is the current training week of the runner, as well as an adjusted marathon time, marathon time star delta. So this time will be the goal time of the runner. So delta above one means they want to increase their time, making it slower. And delta less than one make, means they want to reduce their time, making it faster. So we then filter out the cases by only using runners who've achieved OR's goal time and had a similar current training week to OR. And then we return their next week of training, C or W minus one. Then the next week of training for these runners is averaged and we find the runner with the single most similar training week 
that is closest to the average of these training weeks. Now this sounds a bit convoluted, but the reason for this is firstly, rather than averaging the training weeks and returning these values, this could potentially lead to a training week that is not actually feasible or makes sense for a runner. So we would like to recommend a real training week for a runner. Secondly, the reason that we find the average value and then find a runner rather than just finding a single most similar runner is because finding the single most similar runner could mean that we would give a runner who has either been over training or under training for the time they have achieved. So targeting the middle value makes it less likely that the training plan will be either too difficult or too easy for the runner. So here is just a brief overview of the case-based reasoning system. So we have our weekly training profile, which is converted into cases, and then we can find the similarity between the current case and the case bases using a Euclidean distance. And then once these similar runners have been found, we either predict the marathon time or recommend the next week of training. And obviously for the recommended training week, the additional feature required is the goal time for the runner. Now, in terms of evaluation, we have 15,000 males with the marathon time less than five hours and 5,000 females with their marathon time between three and five hours, which is across Dublin, London and New York City marathons between the years 2014 and 2017. So here we reduced our data set slightly to be around 20,000 runners from the original 21,000 runners. And you can see that we reduced the times because outside of these times, there were very few runners. So there were quite few slower runners and either slower or really fast female runners. And this made it difficult to make race time predictions. We used tenfold cross validation. So at each of 10 iterations, 10% 10 of the cases were used as test cases while the remaining 90% were used as the case base. And this was done 10 times, such that each 10% was used as the test case only once, and then the er error was averaged over these. So for race time prediction, we compared the root mean squared error of the predicted marathon times versus the actual marathon times of the test cases. For training plan recommendation, we actually compared the training load of recommended plans with the actual plans of the test cases. Firstly, we looked at the error versus K and we decided on K equals to 15 because this was stable for different training weeks and for both men and women. So firstly, looking at the root mean squared error for the three models as training progresses, we can see that for all three models, the error overall decreases as we get closer to race day. So closer to race day, the error is lower, which is what we might expect. You can see that for the baseline model for both men and women, there is a sharp increase in error around the week one to two weeks from the marathon. The reason for this is that there is something called the marathon taper, which is where marathon runners will either significantly reduce their training efforts or stop training in the one to two weeks before the marathon to give their time body time to rest before the race. And during this time, it really depends runner to runner whether they will do this and by how much. So there's a huge amount of variability in this training week, which makes it difficult to be a good predictor of race time. The same thing, although on a lesser extent, you can see in the feature selected model, However, for the multi-week model, this has been completely eradicated because the error continues to decrease one week from the race. The multi-week model is the best performing model for both men and women, and about 12 weeks from the race, the difference between this and the other models is statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. So this model actually performed around the same in terms of error as the ordered four week model that we mentioned from the previous paper. Now, the reason that this model, the single week model is preferred is because it provides more in terms of explainability. So here is an output that we are able to provide to runners based on the 15 similar runners that have been used to generate either their predicted race time or their 
recommended training plan. In this case, it is their recommended training plan. So we have a runner who has a current race time prediction of 216 minutes and they're targeting a race time somewhere between 238 minutes and 242 minutes. Now, this isn't necessarily the most concrete real life example, but you can just see how it works in terms of you can see how we can provide training information in, ter in terms of the number of sessions, total distance, fastest one five ten k We can see how the current runner under you compares to the other runners that were used for their predicted, for their generated recommended training plan in terms of the minimum, mean, median and maximum values. Obviously, we would want to provide this output to a runner in a more easy to understand way but it's just to give an understanding that because we're using a single week of training here we're able to provide concretely the training information and give an understanding of where both the recommended training plan and the race time prediction has come from which at the moment is quite lacking from other similar ways to predict your race time you can get a value and not really have any understanding of where this is coming from so this is one of the real benefits of using case-based reasoning in terms of evaluating training plan recommendations, of course, a live user study would really be required to fully evaluate this, as we would like to get an understanding of whether these recommended plans actually are effective for runners and how do runners respond to these recommendations? Do they use them? Do they find them useful? So a live user study is required, but it was beyond the scope of this work and something we hope to do in the future. Instead, what we're providing here is more of a proof of concept style evaluation. So we're comparing the training load of recommended training plans with the actual training completed by the test runners for different adjusted goal times of plus or minus one to 10 percent. So since our goal time is represented by marathon time star delta, this means we would have a delta between 0 0.9 and 1.1. So what we're expecting to find is that targeting a faster goal time should lead to a more difficult training plan. So the recommended training plan should have a mean weekly pace that is faster. Similarly, if you target a slower goal time, you should have somewhat of an easier training week. In terms of mean weekly pace, we would expect that to be slower. So as expected, a more ambitious target time leads to a faster pace. Remembering that pace is in minutes per kilometer, so a lower value for pace is a faster pace. On the y-axis here, we have the percentage difference in mean weekly pace for the recommended plan compared to the original plan, so the actual plan of the runner. So we can see that targeting a faster time, so having delta less than one, leads to a negative difference, which means that the recommended training plan has a faster pace than the actual training plan of the runner. Similarly, when we target a slower time, so having delta above one means that we have a positive difference. So the recommended plans mean weekly pace is actually slower than the actual training done by the runner. So this provides some encouraging proof of concept style evaluation. And in future, obviously, we would like to do a live user study that will really show whether these recommended plans are feasible and useful for runners. So in conclusion, we've been able to provide both race time predictions and training plan recommendations at different points in training. The prediction accuracy was reasonable and the proof of concept style evaluation recommend for the recommended training plans was quite encouraging. Of course, there are many opportunities to improve the representation and extend it by including heart rate data or using time series analysis techniques for automatic training session classification. In the future, we would like to do a live user study of the training recommendations, and we are currently building a Strava companion app to be able to do that. And this work would be easily adaptable to other endurance sports, including cycling, swimming, and even speed skating, providing there was a similar type of training session data available to be used. Thank you so much for listening and watching this video. If you have any questions about this work, I would love to hear them down below or any comments at all. I would really like to hear your opinions and feedback on this research and what you thought of it. So please comment them down below any questions or overall feedback about this work. Thanks again so much for listening and I will see you in the next video.